I'm so thrilled and honored to be here. I'm a huge admirer of the work of the Cultural Landscape uh, Foundation and also a longtime student of the metropolitan landscapes uh, of the Bay Delta Estuary. So the nature-culture divide, about the nature-culture divide, I guess what I want to say is that landscapes exist not only as physical realities, but also as ideas. Uh, and the nature-culture divide, in a certain way, is a product of our collective imagination. I mean, I, I don't mean to say that there aren't forces that are properly categorized as human and forces over which people don't have any control, and that is certainly true. But to say instead that in this age of the Anthropocene, cultural intention and environmental processes are present simultaneously in every landscape that we know. And they're always interacting, that the reiterative and cumulative interactions among them um, and between them produce places where it really becomes impossible to draw a line between nature and artifice, or between economy and ecology, uh, or sometimes even between categories that seem as clear as land and water. And that kind of complexity comes to light vividly along San Francisco's shoreline as soon as you ask yourself what sounds like a very simple question. Where's the edge of the bay? We draw it as a line on the map. I mean, everybody who's come here has, has that map because you got here, uh, and, and you've seen that line. But the circumstances, when you look more closely, are much more ambiguous than that. So how's that complexity manifest? I mean, three slides. On the left-hand side, what a person can see looking toward the shore from the east side of Telegraph Hill. And there's this intense inhabitation of the edge with shipping and recreation and housing and habitat, some land constructed, uh, like the piers, some land not constructed, like Yerba Buena Island. If you look in the center at the scale of the entire bay, you see the trace of that geological channel that heads east from the Golden Gate, uh, that, that sort of remnant river channel that was the parent of the bay. You can also see the radical transformation uh, of the shape and the size of the bay by landfill, and also the very intense urbanization that's all around the perimeter of the bay and way beyond it. Uh, and then if you look on the right-hand side at the scale of the region, the bay is connected, intimately connected, to the Great Central Valley of California. It is the only outlet to the sea for all the water that comes off the eastern slope of the Sierra Nevada. So, I mean, where's the edge of the bay? I mean, maybe it's that ridge line. And at all of these scales, there's a really incredible range of ecological negotiations between people's intentions for the landscape and the non-anthropogenic forces that are at work there. So here's where I feel, I feel like we have a problem, real problem. Because these hybrid ecologies don't tend to fit our usual terms for the landscape, and because language is really our first tool for perception, a lot of what happens under our noses is just hidden in plain sight. So we're living, I feel like, in a kind of opposite condition to that beautiful story about the Inuit, that their many words for snow uh, allowed them to see nuances to, to which the rest of us are blind. And, I, and that kind of illegibility is a problem because this landscape, the landscape of the Bay, and many others like it are facing tremendous pressure from climate change. And whatever our roles in the evolution of the environment, whether we're designers or scholars or policymakers or politicians or citizens, which we all are, our ideas about what might be possible uh, arise from the language we use to describe the places we know now. So a little bit about the work um, I've been doing on the Bay in the last number of years. It began with the Exploratorium uh, with two curators named Pete Richard and uh, Susan Schwarzenberg who were interested in bringing environmental content to a museum that had been focused on the laboratory sciences. So in that summer of 2007, we first heard that the museum might move to the waterfront. And what you're seeing here is two aerials that show you about this complex edge of the Bay. So okay, so here's the uh, new Exploratorium Piers uh, 15 and 17 uh, on what we now understand as the edge of the bay, the seawall. But you can also see just by kind of looking at where the hill starts that that edge of the bay we know now is not the edge of the bay that was there when San Francisco began to be densely inhabited after the gold rush. So where's the edge of the bay combined with two seminal ideas from the uh, Exploratorium's founder, Frank Oppenheimer. Uh, first, that the best tool for preventing nuclear Armageddon, he had been a Manhattan Project physicist, uh, was an educated citizenry. Uh, and second, that the best way to teach people uh, was through their own perception and their own experience. So Susan, Pete, and I had the idea uh, 
to make an observatory at this new site, a bay observatory like Patrick Geddes' observatory in Edinburgh, and I undertook to make a kind of working dictionary of the shoreline with the notion that all you really needed for an observatory, because we didn't know when the building would be completed, was a window and a lexicon. So something to look through, an interest in observation, and the vocabulary to let you name what was in front of you. So the project, as Brad said, is called Bay Lexicon. I think I like to think intellectually it's situated somewhere in between the Peterson First Guide to the Birds, uh, which gives people a general impression of shape and size of birds, just and Raymond uh, Williams's very beautiful book Keywords, which examines and questions the meanings of words we use all the time without thinking about them. Um, and so it's a kind of working dictionary that's really conceived as a tool for observing and wondering about places that are too often taken for granted. The form of the project, it's a series of flashcards like the ones you had when you were a kid, maybe, that define and examine things you can see along the shoreline, like the Bay Bridge, or actually sometimes things you can't see anymore, like the Embarcadero Freeway. And these are things you encounter either when you look out the windows of Susan's Observatory Gallery, which face west toward the city and east toward the bay, or if you, just, if you decide to leave the museum, which is really the goal of the gallery, you can use the dictionary to make your way all the way from Fort Point um, to Hunter's Point, and, and it talks about things that you'll encounter along that trip. So there are 48 flashcards. They live in a mobile cart that's here. It's parked in the gallery. And here it went outside, sometimes it goes outside, for a little travel along the shore. <laughs> like all flashcards, these flashcards have fronts and backs. And the front shows an image of something you can see, something you're looking at. In this case, looking east from the gallery windows at the Bay Bridge. And then there are identification and annotations of its components. And then there's a question about what this thing you're looking at might mean. And on the back, there's a little essay that speculates about the meaning of that question and a drawing that says, where are you in space? And then also a kind of taxonomy of broad themes to which this site S-I-G-H-T or S-I-T-E is related and which related to other sites or other artifacts or other processes or other phenomena. And what emerges from this kind of examination um, is that apparently simple places and words have very varied and, and complicated meanings and that tangible, immediate artifacts and phenomena are, are tied to very complex and often invisible practices and processes and relationships that are, sh are shaping and reshaping the Bay all the time. So a few examples to talk about how almost as soon as you start looking, the complicated and interesting and messy and dynamic relationship between nature and culture is everywhere. So this is a uh, flashcard about tides what tides do and what is done to tides. So in San Francisco, as you probably know, the tides advance and retreat uh, twice a day. Um, and until 1851, that meant that every day, twice a day, the boundary between the bay and the city, or the bay um, and the land, changed. But then in 1851, a federal uh, act um, said that land along the shore um, could be owned. Previously, its ambiguity had meant that it couldn't be owned. So the potential value of property trumped that fluctuating um, shoreline, and the tidelands disappeared behind seawalls and underneath constructed uh, ground. So you could say in a weird way that an idea changed reality, that a social compact defining uh, land as a commodity uh, fixed the shoreline and produced high terrain, relatively high terrain. And at the built edge of the bay, it's hard, you can't see the tides anymore. I mean, unless you're in a boat and looking at the seawall, but they're still there. Walk down to Chrissy Field uh, 15 minutes from here and you'll see them. Sail a boat and you'll feel them. Work as a bar pilot and you'll need to know them by, by heart because a distance of a few feet um, can mean the difference between a massive ship's making it all the way from the Golden Gate to its birth at port or not. Or ask a fish, because the tides also change the salinity every day, twice a day, whether or not we know they're there. An example of that, I guess, is sort of about geomorphology at the scale of the body. Um, 
about retaining walls. So walls have turned San Francisco from a cluster of uninhabitable hills into a city's worth of building sites, not to mention the roads and stairs that let you get from one place to another. But those claims don't go uncontested because nothing stands still in the landscape. And so behind every retaining wall, earth is working to undermine it. The soil is shifting and settling. Sometimes there's a good shake if there's an earthquake. Tree roots are pushing against the wall. Water's ponding behind it, and sooner or later, as all the landscape architects here know, every wall, even the sturdiest wall, cracks, and then one crack leads to another, and crevices and gaps become habitat for Peter Del Tredici's um, <laughs> uh, friends, uh, which we used to call weeds. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and so there's a kind of uh, process here that left alone the wall would just crumble and the hill that interrupted would return to an angle of repose. Down uh, toward the south, toward Hunter's Point, a funny, interesting story about how a derelict jetty has become the site of primary succession. It's a sort of combined product of intention and uh, accident, I guess you could say. So in 1970, the Port of San Francisco started to build new land for a container terminal at India Basin, and that land was also going to be the landing of a new southern crossing of the bay. But in 1977, the work stopped because the crossing was de uh, defeated and Oakland had already taken over uh, as the, the Bay Area's primary port. And for years and years, this forsaken embankment was subject only to the action of waves and tides. So nothing, right, except lots and lots, because longshore drift was depositing uh, sediment and sand on the, on the southern side of the um, of the jetty. And then uh, plants and animals colonized the land and a marsh uh, emerged from the rubble and began to find advocates. And then a legal settlement, uh, a settlement which was um, restitution for the use of substandard fill to uh, build the jetty was used to fund uh, an initiative for um, uh, advocacy and restoration, restoration, a funny word, supporting, let's say, this ecosystem that had appeared spontaneously. So finally, in 1999, this pier became a park, and it was named because it looked like the head of Heron uh, that had found a home there. So the reconstruction of the shore's edge for industry actually led to the re-emergence of what is otherwise mostly a vanished ecology along the Bay Shore. These relationships among people and the environment and among biota and non-living artifacts in the landscape are far-reaching in space and time. So a fisherman on Pier 7 might not know that the fish on his line is actually tying him to the gold rush, but it does. In 1845, Mexican colonists near New Almaden realized that they had found cinnabar and that cinnabar was the parent material of mercury. So they started refining it just in time to send huge quantities um, to the Sierra Nevada where the mercury was used to separate gold and silver um, from ore and... Um, and rock, and then carried by the detritus of hydraulic mining, that mercury came down to the bay um, in vast quantities. So we call changeable people mercurial because, mercurial because mercury can be so radically transformed. It starts as a rock, the rock is crushed and heated to make a vapor, uh, the vapor is cooled into a liquid. The liquid allows the catalytic conversion of um, ore from rock. And then when it gets washed into the water, it's taken up by um, bacteria. The bacteria metabolize it into methylmercury, which is a neurotoxin. When the methylmercury um, enters the bodies of, of uh, plankton who eat the bacteria, it is intensified. It's intensified again when small fish eat plankton, and again when big fish, big fish eat small fish, and again when uh, people eat the big fish. So when you're fishing in the bay, the past is not a foreign country. One last example in honor of the people who got to go to Alcatraz yesterday um, <laughs> about islands. So islands are isolated, and isolation is always defined in relation to belonging. And geologically, those rocky islands in the bay are part of the coast range, and they read as part of the coast range until the end of the last, last ice age. When the glaciers melted, the bay filled up like a bathtub, and suddenly um, one high point was separated from another by water. So now the islands are a kind of paradox. They're close to the city, but they're made distant because you can't get there on your feet. 
And here's a situation where I guess you could say that nature has affected culture so that places defined by separation became places defined for separation. Federal criminals incarcerated at Alcatraz, uh, immigrants to the US from um, Asia were detained at, at Angel Island. And to be held on those islands was to be isolated, to be cast out of society or to be kept out of society. Nowadays, um, those islands are tourist attractions, and the voyage out is, I guess, a much smaller adventure than it used to be, uh, so that what was a journey into exile is now a chance to, um, let's say, get away from it all. So I wanted to end with this one in order to make the point that places change, that what we think they mean also changes, and so does the way in which we describe them and the way we see them because language colors our perception. And what all of this says to me, and what I, what I hope it might say to you too, is that it's time to change our vocabularies when we talk about nature and culture. That rather than conceiving of the urban landscape as evidence of a divide, uh, maybe we need to look at it as the product of a dialogue. And if we can do that, I think we're gonna be better equipped as advocates for the places we care about. If we can get our lexicons and our perceptions and our ideas about the future, because all of those things are intimately connected to each other, to come from something that the California ecologist Ed Ricketts called for in the 1940s, uh, the careful observation of the landscape as it is, and not as we wish it were. Thank you.